Welcome to the tutorial animating the camera. So although you may not realize it, there are often as many camera moves in an animation as there are in a live action film. A lot of the times a character is standing statically while it's really the camera that's moving around. So jump cuts, zooms, and camera pans are as important as the storytelling itself. So there are three ways to add a camera to your scene. Um, I don't know if you remember from one of the previous tutorials, but we've already added a camera to our scene. Um, the reason that you cannot see it in the timeline, but you can see it in the network view, is because of the display setting that's been selected. So if you remember from one of the previous tutorials, if you right click anywhere here in the top gray bar, you can select the display from the list and it opens up this drop down menu. And from this drop down menu, you have to choose display all. So now if you scroll down in the timeline, you'll see the camera there. Um, before, there's the different display settings. If you just wanted to see your karate rabbit, if you just wanted to see the scenes display, if you wanted to see what was going on through the camera view. So that's why that menu here exists. So to add a camera to the timeline, you can either click on this plus button here and from the menu, select camera. So if you scroll down, you'll see that there's another camera, camera underscore one. You can also go to the top menu and select insert camera. So now we have a second camera here. Or you could go to the module library. And select camera from the move tab. It actually exists in a few of the tabs. And drop it into your scene. So I'm just going to get rid of those cameras here, one, two, and three, and just deal with the one that we already have. So the camera is unlike any other layer in that it needs a peg to be animated. However, once a peg is added, you can use all the same tools you would use to animate a drawing layer. And that being said, it's recommended that you add a peg to your camera in order to animate it. So you can do this by clicking on the peg button here, add peg, with the camera selected. And that way, your peg is automatically named the name of the layer that was selected, which is camera, with the dash P to tell you that it's a peg, as well as the symbol here, allowing you to know that it's a peg. So if we uncollapse the camera peg, You'll notice that all the same transformation exists as um, that exists for a peg attached to a drawing element. So you can animate the X, Y, and Z position, the scale, the rotation, the skew, etc. Um, when you make a transformation on the Z position, so that's the Z axis, you're actually what we call trucking in or trucking out. So that means that you're moving inwards into the scene, so you're moving past this door into the sky beyond. So it's often recommended when you animate with a camera that you do it using the top and side views. So I'm going to click on this little gray arrow here. I never actually got rid of my top and side windows, um, but because I want to see them both at the same time, I'm not going to have them both here. I'll keep the side here, actually I'll keep the top here, and I'll delete the side. And then over here in this window, where we have the network view, I'm going to choose the side. So now I have all three perspectives that I like to see, the camera view, the top view, and the side view. So by default, the camera is set up at the zero, zero position. So its height is exactly the center of this camera height. Its um, position along the right to left is exactly in the center as well. And it's actually back from the center point here by 12 fields. And once again, that number only really means something to people who've done traditional animation. Okay, so let's try animating the camera. So if we click on this button here, the render mode button, you can see what your shot would look like at frame one. So let's hold the shot for maybe 10 frames, let's say. So let's drag our red playhead here to the 10th frame. And then let's add a keyframe onto the peg the peg that's right here, and let's use one of the methods that we learned earlier today. So we, we just added a keyframe. 
Then if we drag the red playhead down to say frame 50, we can do the same thing and add another keyframe there. Then using the transform tool uh, with the animate mode selected, we want to select one of the two camera cones. So if you haven't figured it out yet, what you see here, this large V, is the camera cone from an aerial perspective. And then in the side view, it's the camera cone from a profile perspective. And I just realized one thing, because we've been adding and deleting so many cameras um, at the start of this tutorial, we have to make sure we have the correct camera selected. So go to your scene menu here at the top, camera, and select camera, not default camera. So now your camera is highlighted in yellow, which lets you know that you can animate it. So I'm going to grab the camera, so my cursor turned into sort of a transform cursor. I'm going to pull it well upwards, which means it's actually receding uh, into space. Maybe something like that. It's making me realize that my balcony isn't close enough or wide enough down, so it's something I'm going to have to fix. And then if I want, I can also raise it up this way, but I think it was actually pretty good where it was around there. Um, and then just to see what that looks like, let's bring our red playhead back here to frame one and then click on the play button. So it's a bit fast, but you get the, the point. There are things being animated around it, and as they're, they're moving about, our camera is actually trucking in. And right now it's trucking in on a straight line, but in one of the um, upcoming tutorials I'll also show you how to curve the path so you can actually key in curves so that the camera can actually zigzag across. It doesn't have to always just go straight wherever it's going. And the last thing I'd like to show you, actually, and I don't know if it happens here, it might. It's not so bad, but maybe if we lift the camera cone upwards. Um, what tends to happen, oh I just keyed this in because I was in the wrong, on the wrong frame. So what sometimes happens with pencil lines as opposed to paintbrush lines is that as you zoom in they become um, increasingly thick and almost too thick and sometimes you want to normalize that so that they still look thin even though you're approaching the drawing object. And let me just select something here to see if it's a uh, on the dojo layer to see if it's a pencil line. So it's a brush line. It's a brush line. I don't know if we have any pencil lines here where that might occur. Yeah, they're pretty much all brush lines at this point. So let me draw a pencil line in so that it becomes obvious of what's going on. So it's still in the dojo layer because there's zero visibility, so that was a not a good idea. So let's make it a nice thick line like that. So as we draw the camera back, let me set this back to where it should be and we're coming forward, we're coming forward, we're coming forward. Sometimes these pencil lines look like they're getting enormously thick. So there is a way of trucking in your camera without having a giant line appear um, in your face. And that's by playing with the layer properties. So if we double click on the dojo, we open up the layer properties. Under the advanced tab you'll see that there's a bunch of options that pertain to the line thickness. So the first thing you would have to select is adjust pencil line thickness. Um, and it won't affect any of the brush lines, it's just going to affect this one pencil line on the dojo layer. Um, and then there's the normal thickness and you generally want this selected otherwise it's not going to read any of the pencil lines. They are going to become invisible and it'll only read what's on the color art layer. So we want that one selected too. However if you have nothing else changed or selected, the normal thickness option will keep this line at the thickness that it's already at without making any changes. So the zoom independent thickness is what's going to keep it thinner as you truck in even though it should technically get larger. So it's going to stay the same size but sort of appear like it's getting thinner. Then you have a bunch of uh, 
options here. So obviously you can choose the minimum or maximum that you'll let these um, automated values um, oscillate between. So it'll never get thicker or thinner than the minimum or the maximum. The proportional value is a number by which the line thickness is multiplied by. So I believe the line thickness of this was 25. Here where it's going to stay 25 because it'll be multiplied by 1. You can put in a decimal number like 0 0.5, it'll be halved. You can put in a number like 2 and it'll be doubled to 50. Um, the constant plays more with the pixelated ratio. So as we're doing this, you're not really seeing a change, but when you render your um, film, you'll see it in the actual render that this constant value is what gives you the same ratio as the proportion, but it deals more with the pixels. Um, and I think that's it for all the options, the line thickness. And we're just going to delete that unnecessary line. So that's it for the tutorial animating the camera. And that's it for all the videos for the animation paths part one series.